The reason I want to start our looking at the eschatological discourse in Matthew by going to 1 Thessalonians is for sake of contrast. So we want to look, starting at verse 13, 413. The assumption of biblical scholars is that most of the Pauline letters are written to address a specific problem or set of problems. And most scholars think 1 Thessalonians is Paul's earliest letter, his very first letter, at least that we have. He might have written others that haven't survived. And one of the big concerns in the church at Thessalonica is what happens to those people who have died before Jesus has returned? And the term that's significant here that keeps being used in different places is the parousia in Greek, which is really just the word for presence. But we use words like rapture and second coming and stuff, but the biblical word is parousia. And the reason that's important is remember we said, I am with you always. It's about presence. So it's about the, the human one returning, the Christ returning. So the community in Thessalonica is worried that those who have died before the parousia will never experience the eschatological salvation. What happens to them? It seems odd to our way of thinking because we think of people going to be with Jesus or something when you die, however you, you think about that. But remember, this is early in Christian development of thought. So starting at verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. So Paul is being a good pastor here. Don't worry about those who have died. Jesus will take care of them. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the day, will by no means precede those who have died. So the coming of the day. For the Lord himself with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the faithful who have died will be raised, meet Jesus in the clouds. Then those of us who are alive Go up and meet Jesus in the clouds, those of us who have been faithful. What's implied about everybody else? <laughs> Left behind. Who said that? Have you read the books? Who's read? Come on, let's be honest. Who's read? There we go. There we go. The Left Behind series. Now that, apart from the quality of the books or the specifics of them, that view is absolutely right in terms of... 1 Thessalonians view, Revelations view, that the faithful will be taken away and not have to deal with the tribulation, that kind of stuff. The unfaithful will be stuck behind in damnation in some way, left behind. So we need to keep that in mind because that is not Matthew's view. right? So that gives us a contrast. So let's go back to Matthew 24. Uh, the translation I'm using is the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. We were just talking about translations a little bit. Um, I still think the New Revised Standard Version is the best for studying. The NIV is also quite good. And next, they have some different um, ideologies of translation behind them. Um, one that you might know, you hear a lot about in Methodist circles now, is the Common English Bible. I think it's fine for reading, but not good for study uh, because of their approach to translation. Um, so it, like, if you want to read through big stretches during Lent, say that was your discipline, I want to read the whole Bible in Lent. <laughs> um, that would be a good translation. But if you want to study a small passage, and look, you want something that has better footnotes and, and better... So, for instance, 
the common English Bible would assign one person to translate, say, Philippians. And then a committee would take that translation and make it fit with the language people used in other places. The NRSV or the NIV were translated by committee. They fought over words along the way. And there, there's always mistakes or uh, commentators. I mean, biblical scholars make a career by saying everybody else got it wrong. Right? So that's just part of it. And um, so there's no perfect translation. But I, I do think those two are the best ones to use for uh, intensive study. NRSV and NIV. King James... Amazing feat for its day. It was beautiful language, but we have discovered so many more manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, since then, and better um, that we know are earlier that represent other stuff, that it's just out of date. So I, I still love its language. I mean, who can't appreciate you know some of that and the beauty of it? I, I remember um, watching the Ken Burns um, um, Civil War documentary. And I was just amazed that these boys all fighting wrote, they would read all those letters to their girlfriends and mothers, and they were so beautiful. And I, I just couldn't imagine these farm boys writing that way. And an English professor said, you got to remember, their primary textbook was the King James Bible. That's the way they learned to read and practiced to read, and they learned to write by it. So it's beautiful, but it's not good for study. Um, so NIV, NRSV are, are the ones. All right, so we're just going to walk through um, chapters 24 and 25 piece by piece. And sorry, I got to get to the right place in my notes. Um, and um, look at this with fresh eyes. So, what you want to be noticing is how thoroughly eschatological it is. And we want to look for how is an experience of the already not yet described in metaphorical terms here, right? So I want us to not get caught so much on the chronology. I'm going to talk about that as a way of getting rid of it in a way, but we want to break it apart. Now, to help you a little bit, another handout. So I'll give half over here and half this way, and we'll let it see if that goes any faster. This has a comparison. Um, of Mark 13, which is Mark's eschatological discourse, and then Matthew's revision of it and expansion of it. I think it's terrible. I really do, actually. I think it's horrible. I, it is um, Eugene Peterson's own theology imported onto the text often. Again, it's not bad for a nice read, but it is not worthy of study. It's like the living Bible was... Um, but he also, he, he's honest about that in the way I don't think the Living Bible often was. Um, but I, I think it's terrible for Bible study. Um, and if, if I hear a preacher go today, and I've heard this before, today I'm reading from the message, I go, uh. And then if they say, because I like it better, I get up and walk out. You do not choose a text because you like it better. When you are leading a faith community, you choose a text because you think it's more faithful to the original. Um, and so that argument I'll listen to. Is this an extra one here? Uh, that I'll listen to. But um, So I, I think we need to be careful about translations. But again, we, we shouldn't be idolatrous of any translation. Um, most of us don't read Greek or Hebrew, but let's say you read Greek. The problem is you've got a Greek New Testament. You don't really have any original text there. You've got the composite of thousands of manuscripts that scholars have tried to figure out the best reading for here because remember, they didn't have photocopiers back in the day. And so literally there were just hundreds of mistakes made for every chapter of the New Testament. And many of those were just mistakes, but at times, because it wasn't considered Scripture, Bible, when it was first copied, they would change things to make them better. So they would improve wording, etc. So I'll give you an example. Um, the, and these are the kinds of things you have to study. Mark 1 has the story of the cleansing of the leper. And in that story, there's a footnote in the NRSV, and uh, probably in the NIV too, I just use the NRSV more, where it says, 
Jesus moved with compassion, or some translations say pity, said, yeah, the, the, the leper says, if you will, cleanse me. Jesus says, I will, I do choose so. Um, and it says, Jesus moved with compassion, said, there's a footnote said, some manuscripts say moved with anger. Now that radically changes the meaning. Which one is original? Now the nice thing about the translation is it's given us both. But one of the things we know about early scribes is that they tried to take readings that seemed to not make sense. Like maybe some other person made a mistake or something, and they would clean them up. So most scholars, not most, a lot of scholars think that Jesus moved with anger was the original. Because it's hard to imagine why a scribe would change it from compassion to anger. But it's very easy to see why a scribe would change it from anger to compassion. So... All of this is to say is our knowledge of the ancient text continues to evolve. And um, one of the reasons I've been especially dedicated to the NRSV, apart from its translation, is the copyright used to be owned by the National Council of Churches. It was one of their major funding resources. And um, so when the United Methodist Church started promoting they were going to do the Common English Bible, I was not pleased because it's taking money from our ecumenical things. But they knew something I didn't at that point, and that's that the National Council of Churches were, was going to sell the copyright to Harper Collins for good financial reasons, all, and then it was no longer an ecumenical commitment to continue using it. So, Okay, so you, you've got your, your text open, or you've got this for us to go through verse by verse. Um, so let, let's start with the beginning of Matthew 24, and we want to look and see at ways that Matthew changes Mark, but we also just want to appreciate Matthew on Matthew's own terms. As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, you see all these, do you not? I tell, truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. All right, so most biblical scholars assume the temple's already been destroyed, and part of the reason Mark wrote this originally was to make sense of it theologically. There are some scholars who still want to argue, though, that Jesus is predicting this. So you can find both arguments. But look at the next questions that come. When Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so now he's you know outside the temple, um, outside the city, on a mountain, a hill overlooking the city. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will this be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? All right, what's this? When will this be? What does that pronoun refer to? Seems to be the destruction of the temple. But then what's that next part? What will be the sign of your coming? Parousia. What will be the sign of your coming? Um, and the end of the age. Now look at Matt, Mark's version of that line, because remember, Matthew used Mark as a source and changed it as he felt needed. Um, the disciples there asked, tell us when will this be, the destruction of the temple, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? What did Matthew add to Mark's version? The parousia and the end of the age. Matthew makes it explicitly eschatological. The question, not just what comes later. So in Mark's version, the disciples ask, okay, when's the temple going to be destroyed? What, what are going to be the signs we should look for related to the temple destroying? Jesus changed, I mean, Matthew changes that so that the disciples ask, okay, when's the temple going to be destroyed? And while we've got your attention, what will be the signs of your coming, the signs of the end? When will that happen? All right, so the question is set up for a thoroughly eschatological read here. Now, I think this, this next part is where a lot of the TV evangelists and everything go awry because they start looking at these signs that are described in this next section and going, see, there's nation rising against nation, etc. But let's listen to how it's langu the language. Jesus answered them, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. 
And you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. You will um, see that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. Notice that line. In other words, what he is describing right now are not signs of the end, but of things explicitly that are not the end. So, you ask me a question, and I start off going, okay, maybe it's first best to answer what is not the answer, and then I'm going to come back to it. That's what Jesus is doing here. So Jesus is saying, people are out there saying that there's a war, so clearly Jesus is about to return. People are saying there's famine, etc. I'm telling you, none of those are signs of the end. So not political disasters, not natural disasters. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. But this is all but the beginning of the birth pangs. Now remember, we've already said the whole gospel of Matthew is a beginning. So it's always the beginning. It's always the headlights, but not the car. So you can rule out watching the news to find out if Jesus has returned. So next comes, then they will hand you. So we've moved from world to you, the disciples. In Matthew, the disciples are almost always representatives of the church, of the community. So when Jesus is talking to the disciples, Matthew is talking to the church. And this discourse is all to the church. It's not, there's no one else listening to this one, right? There's no outsiders listening on. The Sermon on the Mount, for instance, starts off, Jesus sees a crowd, so he goes up a mountain and he talks to the disciples. It's like he's getting away from the crowd so he can talk to them alone. But then at the end it says, and the crowds were amazed. So even though he's talking to the church, the whole world's listening. Now he's talking to the church only. Just the disciples, just the church. So here's the you. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and you will be put to death, and will put you to death. Notice there's some text here in Mark that Matthew uses in another place. If you flipped over to chapter 10, you'd see that. But we just want to stay with Matthew. Um, They will hand you over to be tortured, and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away. They will betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Notice, this is not the end. Enduring to the end, you will be saved. And this, is, uh, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. All right, so this is not a big section to make a bunch out of. This is still negative. It's not political disaster. That's not a sign of the end. It's not a natural disaster. Not a sign of the end. It is not persecution of the church. That is not a sign of the end. That is to be expected. <laughs> That's good news. Right? So that's, that's what's going on. So that is not it. So when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now, that is an odd phrase there. It comes from Mark. Let the reader understand. It is the only place Matthew or Mark literally acknowledges that there is a reader. Now, what I mean is it's like having a stage play, right? And you've got the fourth wall. You don't break the fourth wall and talk directly to the audience. You imagine that there's a closed thing and you're performing for, but that sometimes the play, the narrator will be up here talking and go, did you see what just happened? That's what happens here. The narrator, uh, because who's talking? At this moment in Matthew, who's doing the talking? Jesus is talking. So does Jesus refer to the reader? Matthew breaks into the middle of what Jesus is saying and says to the reader, this is a key point. If I were translating, I would have put this in brackets instead of parentheses. 
Because, you know, uh, brackets usually indicates a comment on as opposed to something included in. This is, this is really a different voice that jumps in and says, okay, did you catch that? Did you catch that? It's like Steven Spielberg popping in the middle of a movie and going, did you see what I did right there? Right? It's that kind of note. So what is going on that is so important? When you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, so we've got all this biblical language here, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. One on the housetop must not go down to take what's in the house. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Why not? No time. you got to run. Save your life. Get out of here. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Why woe to them? Right, it's not a curse on being pregnant or anything. It's, they're going to move slow. Right, you've got to run. These are refugees because it's a description of the um, destruction of Jerusalem. The, the, the soldiers are at the gate. You've got to get out of here. And one of the things we know is that literally... People fled Judea up to Galilee and to Pella. It doesn't matter where, but they, they had to get out of the city. Now, the Romans weren't just looking to kill people, so they didn't want to trap them in. If they could let them get out, you know, a, a key military strategy is you never surround your enemy. Instead, you surround them on three sides so they have a, a place to escape because if they're running, they're not attacking. But if you surround them, they have to fight. So they are glad for them to have a way to get out and, and run. And they did. And that also disperses it. So woe to those. Pray that your flight may not be in winter, because it's hard to flee in winter, or on the Sabbath, because you're not supposed to exercise, you know, do things on the Sabbath. Uh, for that, at that time, there will be great suffering, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. This is a terrible time, he's describing, this destruction of Jerusalem. And if those days had not been cut short, notice how we just switched to past tense. If those days had not been cut short, no one would be saved for the sake of the elect. Those days will be cut short. And now it changes. That if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, do not believe it. So people were saying during the revolt, I'm the Messiah, there's the Messiah. We know there were several uh, mess, uh, supposed messiahs who were trying to lead the people. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce great signs and omens to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. All right, so let's just make very clear what we've got here. Because this is a huge chunk of the discourse. All this is saying is the destruction of the temple is a horrible thing may have eschatological implications even. I mean, it's great suffering, but it is not the parousia. So the things that people are worried about, quit worrying about it. Uh, they may be worrisome in other ways, but don't, for, don't confuse them. So natural disaster? No. They happen. They're terrible. But don't assume that somehow God is using them to bring about the end. Political disasters, nations fight all the time. Cultures fight. People fight in the streets. There's murder, etc. That does not mean it's a sign of the end. The church, if it's doing its job, it's going to raise some hackles from the powers that be. So you are going to be persecuted. Don't assume that's a sign of the end. It's just a sign of what it means to be church. If you're not being persecuted, you may not be being church. A word we need to hear today. And then finally, even the destruction of the temple. Terrible thing. Prefigured in Scripture in Daniel. If we had time, we could show you Matthew uses all, and as is Mark, but all different kinds of biblical references here. This is loaded language here. It, it's, it's a big deal. It's just not the end. It's not the parousia.